about the closeness of God. Uh, the title of this message, um, because Michaela asked me to title my messages for the podcast, is The Close God. Um, so our goal today, guys, is not to present to you what the Bible says necessarily about God's closeness, because then you're not any closer to him. You just know what the Bible says. But, but my goal today is that what you hear will catapult you into a new closeness uh, with your father and, and with his son. Uh, so that's my prayer for, for you today. And, and that's what I hope happens here. Um, you, would, you would move into a new arena, a new area of relationship uh, with him, an, uh, an area that actually makes a difference in your life. Come on. Okay? We, I have, you know, like Pastor Blake said, that I have really have given so much to understanding the character of the Father. And, and uh, I, if I'm not careful, I'm going to get way ahead of myself, so I've got to slow down here. But I've given so much myself to understanding the Father that I've forgotten at times that He is my Father and that I need to have a relationship with Him. I've got so much head knowledge that I forgot about the heart. And uh, so today I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey that I've been through um, and will hopefully, maybe some of this will spill over onto you uh, as well. Sometimes, guys, it doesn't seem like God is close, right? Uh, there are times in life when he actually seems very distant. Um, when... Uh, when that happens, it's easy for us to slip into what psychiatrists call a ghost kingdom mentality. Now, let me explain what that is. So a ghost kingdom in the psychiatric world, uh, a ghost kingdom is what people, when they lose someone, uh, that person becomes a part of their ghost kingdom. Okay, Or perhaps they've never had someone, a child who never had a father. Uh, his father is part of his ghost kingdom. Okay, it's, it's the kingdom of people that are around you that aren't really around you anymore. Maybe a spouse loses, a, a husband loses a wife, or a child loses a parent, or a child, a, a, a brother loses a brother, or a sister, or, or there's a whole array of different situations. And each time that happens, we add a person to our ghost kingdom. And for the rest of our lives, we wonder, what would my life be like now? Maybe 20 years has passed, 30 years, 40 years. What would my life be like now if so-and-so were still alive? Or, or if so-and-so had been born, perhaps? And what if I had I'd never had a big brother and always wanted one? What would my life be like had I had a big brother growing up? He's in my ghost kingdom, okay? And it's an easy thing to... Uh, Sometimes put God in our ghost kingdom. And now we'll take a look at that here in just a minute. When life goes wrong and we experience loss, we tend to place God into our ghost kingdom as if he's just another missing part of our life, right? So let's go back a long ways. In 1986, I lost a cousin. Um, he was uh, he was like a little brother to me. He was two years younger than me, but he was the closest cousin I had. Um, and uh, I lost him to suicide, actually. And um, I he was 24 at the time. I was 26. And he um, when he when he died, I got a phone call that morning that at what had happened. And uh, I immediately was hurt, disappointed, and angered. And I projected a lot of that hurt, anger, and disappointment onto my father, onto God. And my logic was, God, why didn't you tell me this is where he was? I knew, I knew him very well. Okay, I mean, we were really, we were like brothers. I knew him very well, but I didn't know this about him. I didn't know he was there. I knew we had issues. I knew we had some issues but I didn't know he was here, okay? And and I, that day, my cousin went into my ghost kingdom. And still today, 
Still today, I think about him and I wonder, what would life be like if he was still here? For his parents, they're still here. They're in their 80s, late 80s. They're still here. What would their lives have been like these years if he were still here? What would my life, my children's, my children never got to know him or meet him for that matter? What would life have been like if he had gotten to be here? On, on that day, the day that he, he shot himself, he took his life, the day that he shot himself, I was frustrated, I was angry. Perhaps a lot of my anger was at him and I projected it onto the father. But that day, not only did he go into my ghost kingdom, but the father went into my ghost kingdom too. Because I felt, I felt as though as distant now as my cousin was, as unreachable and untouchable, I felt that same way about my father. He was unreachable. He was untouchable. I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't hear from him. So the father wound up with my ghost kingdom. But I was wrong. Even at that time, even on that day, he was still close. He was still close to me. Yes. I didn't know it. I didn't know how to access his closeness. You see, James chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us this. It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. But guys, I, there's something deceptive about that verse, if we're not understanding it right. correctly. Because it gives you the sense that God's out at a distance, but when you start coming toward him, he'll start coming toward you. Guys, that's not it. Right. That's not how it is. God is close now. He's close now. Has anybody, i got some props here. Here's my first one. Has anyone ever looked backwards through binoculars? So you guys are just a few feet away from me. But you look like you're like 40 feet away right now. <laughs> so when you look backwards through binoculars, what happens? Something very close comes becomes very distant, right? And I think that we live our lives often looking back through, through, through binoculars at our Father and at His Son. You know, Scripture says, Paul said that we see dimly, like through a glass right now. And, and I think that's kind of what he means. It's like we're looking through the binoculars backwards right now. I think what this Scripture says, when in James, come close to God and God will come close to you, I think what that means is get these things out of the way. Get this out of your way because he's standing right in front of you. Get this out of the way. When my cousin, when my cousin died, that whole event became a huge set of binoculars that I was looking through backwards. My father was never, he was never distant. He was never far from me. He was always right there. So, how close is God? How close is the Father? It tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 8. It says, what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. If you declare with your mouth and believe with your heart, then you will be saved. We all know that verse, right? But the point that I want to make is what it tells us. It says that the word is near you. And here's what we know about the word. That word in Greek is rhema. Rhema means the spoken word. Okay? It says in Hebrews 1, 1, 1 through 3, God is now speaking through his son. It says that he's spoken various ways and sundry ways in the past, but now yeah. he's speaking through his son. Yes. So who now is the word? Yes. Jesus yes. is the word. He is the word that God is speaking. We know from John, first chapter of John, it says that the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. He is the word, although that's a different Greek word. He is still the word. Yes. The word, the speaking word here is Jesus. So Jesus equals the spoken word. God is as close as we can believe with our hearts and state with our mouths. 
It says in Luke chapter 6, 45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, so the, the verse, the prior verse that we read talks about our hearts and our mouths. But here's what I want to point out. The mouth only follows the heart, right? It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So, so we don't, it's in our hearts that we, we bring forth what comes out of our mouths, okay? So here's the deal. Jesus, chapter uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, he said this, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul. You know, these three are interrelated, heart, mind, and soul, okay? There, there's nothing physical about that. All of that has to do with our thoughts, our heart, our mind, and our soul. Okay, now there's a difference. They're different, but they're also related at the same time. And here's, here's one of the ways they're related and one of the ways they're different. In, when you do anything, when you decide that you're going to do something, that decision is made in the heart. Like, Michaela, you, at one, some point in your life, you decided that you wanted to learn music. And Donna, I know that right, right now Donna is learning music. But it wasn't a decision you made intellectually. It was a decision you made in your heart. In your heart, you wanted to do this. You wanted to worship God. And so you put your mind to learning. So the mind follows the heart. The mind follows the heart. Just the same way the mouth follows the heart. Yeah. So the word, Jesus, is near you. He is in your mouth. And we can also say it this way. He is in your mind. Right? The word is near you. He is in your mouth. And the word is who? It's Jesus. So Jesus is near you. He's in your mouth. But the reason he's in your mouth, the reason you speak him, is because he's in your mind. He's in your heart. He's in your soul. He's in your mind. Yes. Okay? So Abraham, Jacob, and Moses, they each had physical encounters with, with the Father. Okay? One. They each had one physical encounter, except maybe Moses might have had two. Okay? With the Father. Yet they had an ongoing conversation with him for years. Mm -hmm. Where was that conversation happening? Come on. In their minds. In their minds. He was close to them in their minds. Okay? Perhaps we're going to discover God's closeness in our minds. Just like the saints of old did. So I'm going to make a strange statement. But you'll see what I mean by it real quickly. We discover God's closeness and we remove the backward binoculars by abandoning our physical sight and focusing on finding him in our minds. Okay? So allow me to tell a story. It's a story about a pastor whose name is Bob. Bob Wilkins from New Jersey. Okay? And his friend, Roxanne. Okay? So I'm going to try to do this without having to read, because I know the story pretty well. Um, so let me... Uh, Bob, pastor in New Jersey, he had a, one of his members of his church, had a relative... He was going through some mental issues and wound up in a mental institution. So Bob, being a you know being a loving pastor, um, he told that his he told his church member, "Hey, I want I want to go visit your your relative." So he started visiting his relative every two weeks. He would go to the the um, the mental institution and he would visit his relative, and uh, he would pray with her, talk to her about Jesus, and and you know do those kinds of things and. You know, eventually, over the weeks and months, that person got better and was released from the mental institution. But while Bob was there, while Bob was there, Bob noticed every time he would meet with her or him, I don't even know what, what it was, every time Bob would meet with this person, they were in like the cafeteria area where you know, people all went to congregate and meet or whatnot. Okay, he always noticed there was this one young lady off in a wheelchair by herself rocking back and forth, just rocking, eyes wide open with a terrified look on her face, okay? And so after a couple of weeks, he just decided to stop by her wheelchair, 
and tell her hello, but she didn't respond to it. Okay, um, and so he, he moved on. But the next time he came, he decided he wanted to continue to try to reach out to this person. So, so he talked to her for a little bit. She just rocked away, terrified look in her face, eyes wide open, no response. He did this week after week after week and got no response. So at some point he uh, he went to the uh, doctors and uh, and said, well, who you know who is this person? In the, in the wheelchair that rocks back and forth. Um, and they told her, they told him the story. So here's her story. Her name is Roxanne. Okay? Roxanne was 10 years old. She grew up right here in Louisiana. All right? When she was 10 years old, she lived with her, her, her single mom. Her mom was a single mother. Okay? She lived with her single mom. In their house, apparently it wasn't in New Orleans because they had a basement in this house. They don't have basements here. And I think, it doesn't say this, but I think it was Hurricane Betsy that, that struck them because it, just some of the details made me believe it was. Um, so, so what happened is her mother, Roxanne's mother, was terribly, was petrified of storms, of bad weather. Okay, um, and back in those days, you didn't necessarily know when a bad storm was coming or how bad a storm was going to be. I remember Betsy. I was alive. I was five years old when Betsy hit. I, I, I don't remember any details. I was too young. But, um, but she was 10 years old when the storm hit, and she remembers it quite vividly. Uh, so what happened was they went downstairs in the middle of the storm when the storm really got to really shaking things. She went, they both went downstairs into the basement. She described that later, she said that it was like a hundred freight trains coming over their house. That's what the sound was like. Um, her, her, there was at a point when the entire house collapsed over them. They were in the basement, so they were safe. But the entire house collapsed. And the trauma of that sent mom into some kind of a uh, emotional... I don't, I don't know what to call it. Uh, she, she began rocking, sitting. She was in a sitting position, rocking back and forth, eyes wide open with a petrified look on her face. And the little girl, Roxanne, was there for two days with her mom in that state before they got rescued, before she got help. Okay, so it's a very, very traumatic situation that Roxanne went through. So... What happened was they were rescued. Two days later, they were rescued, and uh, mom never came out of it. Never came out of it. Mom went to her grave, rocking back and forth, eyes wide open, couldn't speak, couldn't think of anything. She was she was just bound to that terrified point in her life. She died 17 years later. But here's what happened. So a, re a family relative, a relative, took Roxanne into their home. And they lived in New Jersey. So they brought mom to a mental institution in New Jersey to be close where Roxanne could visit her and that sort of thing. Okay? <clears throat> so Roxanne grew up very, very fearful. Okay? Very, very nervous. Okay? She had been through such a traumatic experience that in many, many ways she had not yet ever come out of it. Okay? Um, she had several nervous breakdowns. Um, she was uh, she was ten years old when that happened. Um, many years later, she she married as in her young early twenties. Um, her, her husband couldn't deal with her anymore, and, and he eventually he divorced her. Um, and then the family that had originally taken her in said no to her. We, you were a handful when we raised you, and we can't take you anymore. So they didn't take her back, and then mom died. Was, it, 17 years had passed. Okay, 17 years had passed since the storm. Mom died, and that was the straw that broke the camel's back in Roxanne's life. She couldn't take any more, and she sat down, started rocking back and forth with her eyes wide open, and she became her mom, basically. She relinquished her life completely and just stepped into her mom's life. And she became her mom. They put her in the very same mental institution in New Jersey where her mom was. Her mom had passed away. So there she was, the daughter of the lady.
that rocked back and forth for 17 years, eyes wide open, terrified, doing the exact same thing. After two years, Roxanne's in the mental institution for two years, doctors said she would never cooperate, she would never acknowledge even their presence. Doctors would try to work with her, help her, so forth. They, she would not acknowledge they were there. She just continued to rock back and forth, eyes wide open, terrified. Bob discovers her. Okay, when he's in there visiting his the relative of his parishioner, Bob discovers her and he starts to reach out to her. Every two weeks he goes over there, even after his his church member's relative leaves. Okay, there she's she's allowed to leave. He still goes back for Roxanne. He felt like the Lord told him to stay, to, to stay, keep going. And he would try to talk to her, and she would not even in any way acknowledge him. Until once. Until once, when he said, I know I've been coming here for, for several months, and I know I might be bothering you, and if you want me to leave, he said, I'm just, this will be my last time. But if you want me to come back, just say so. And she squeezed his hand. That was the first acknowledgement ever for anyone that Roxanne needed help and she wanted help. Okay? So he stayed. He continued with her week after week, turned into month after month. Eventually, <clears throat> he got Roxanne to start responding to him and actually start talking to him. Okay? Um, he took that opportunity to teach Roxanne Here's the deal. He knew what Roxanne needed. She needed Jesus, and she needed to know that Jesus was close to her. Okay? But he knew the only way to do that was to do it in her mind. Okay? So he taught Roxanne to make a safe place in here, in her mind, and invite Jesus into it. Okay? And, and Roxanne did that. So during one such meeting, they had several times, several meetings like this. Okay? During one such meeting, Bob had her leave the safe place, okay? And he took her to the place of the trauma, okay? 1965, Hurricane Betsy, her house, her basement, and her mom, rocking back and forth, eyes wide open, okay? I, at this point, guys, I want to read something to you. I want to read to you the account of the way Bob described what took place this this day between he and Roxanne and Jesus. Okay? Roxanne is in her mind. Okay? She went into her safe place. But he took her out of her safe place and said, I want to bring you here. So in her mind, she's now in the basement. 1965, Hurricane Betsy's just storming. The house has collapsed and her mind is rocking back and forth. Bob said, Roxanne, let me put my glasses on, guys. I'm sorry. Bob said, Roxanne, can you see Jesus in the basement? Roxanne, with a frightened voice, no, no, he's not down here. No one's down here. It's only me and my mom. And she's just staring. She won't even look at me. Why doesn't she talk to me? Bob, try moving the lantern away from your mother. Walk around the basement. Look for him. Do you see him? Roxanne, no. Bob, maybe we should ask him to come into your basement. Why don't we ask Jesus to be there? You know he wants to be there with you. At this point, Bob prays for the Holy Spirit to point Roxanne to Jesus and then encourages Roxanne to pray. Roxanne says, Jesus, will you please come and help me? I'm so scared. I need you. Bob said, keep moving the lantern around. Do you see him? Roxanne, there, by the stairs, there's someone. He's coming down the stairs. I can see his feet. Bob, bring the lantern over to him. Tell me what you see. Tell me what you hear. Roxanne, all I hear is the storm, the terrible, evil storm. It sounds like a hundred trains running over our house. Bob, what does Jesus look like? Roxanne, he's on the basement floor now, standing in front of me. It's him. He looks calm, very peaceful. He's just looking at me with these strange, calm eyes. Roxanne, 
Talking about, excuse me, Bob, is he saying anything? Jesus, will you speak to Roxanne? Roxanne, he can't. The storm is too loud. I can't hear anything but the storm. Jesus is walking away from me now. Bob, follow him, Roxanne. Where is he going? Roxanne, he's going over to my mom. He's kneeling down next to mommy. Roxanne pauses for a bit at this point. After waiting, Bob continues. What's Jesus doing now? He's stroking mommy's hair. He's holding her hand. He's whispering something in her ear. Roxanne again pauses for a moment and then begins to cry. Bob, what else is happening, Roxanne? Why are you crying? Roxanne, Jesus is shutting mommy's eyes with his fingers. He's closing her eyes. She doesn't seem scared anymore. Jesus is hugging her and she seems calm. She's resting her head on her shoulders, his shoulders. There's a relatively long pause in the dialogue at this point. Bob senses something significant, some significant healing is taking place. So he just quietly allows the Holy Spirit to do his work. Bob, is Jesus doing anything else? Just watch and see what else Jesus might do. Roxanne, the storm is gone. Jesus made the storm go away. There's no more noise. There's sunshine coming down the stairway now. The whole basement is lit up. There must be an opening at the top of the stairs. Bob, do you see, do you think you're supposed to go up the stairs? Roxanne, I don't. Bob, maybe Jesus will direct you. Roxanne, he's getting up now. Mom is sleeping. He's coming over to me. Bob, what does Jesus look like? Roxanne, he looks happy. He's smiling. Roxanne pauses again and a slight smile comes over her face. Bob, did Jesus say something to you? Yeah, he hugged me and he whispered in my ear, the storm is over. The storm is over, Roxanne. It's safe to go outside now. Bob, do you feel it's safe now? Roxanne, I think so. Jesus is holding out his hand. He wants me to go up the stairs with him. Are you going now? Roxanne, we're walking up the stairs, but I don't want to leave mom down here. I don't want to leave her alone. Bob, tell it to Jesus. What does he say? Roxanne, Jesus says we need to let her rest her eyes. They've been stuck open for so long, and they're very tired. He says it's okay to say goodbye to her now. She's at peace, and I'll see her again. The episode ends with Roxanne going over to her sleeping mother, kissing her on the forehead, and saying goodbye. She and Jesus then leave the basement and go into a field Roxanne used to play in when she was a little girl. Guys, Roxanne got healed. She got healed. She went outside from the basement in, a, in, a, in her mind and in her life. She was able to leave that basement that she was stuck in for those 17, 20, 19 years because she had an encounter with Jesus, but the encounter was here. Is it possible, guys, that loving the Lord with all of your mind means more than just an intellectual understanding? Of yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. It means much more than just an intellectual understanding. I know this. I know this. I have engulfed myself in an intellectual understanding of him for years and years and years. And, and, and I still was yearning for him. Is it possible that loving the Lord with all our mind includes submitting our minds to the experiences and the instructions he wants to give us here? At the risk of seeming very gullible, I'd like to share with you some of my experiences. Okay? These are very personal experiences. I'm going to describe my safe place. I have a safe place that I go into in my mind. Okay? It is a, it's from a painting that hangs in my bedroom. It's a painting of a road, but the road is covered with leaf litter because it's fall. And the trees have turned yellow and red and orange. And all the leaves are all along the road. And on both sides of the road are tall, tall trees. Sycamore, 
and um, maple. Deciduous trees that all turn yellow and red. Beautiful trees, 60, 70, 80 feet tall, all down the road. It's a beautiful scene, incredible scene. And in this safe place, there is a bench on the right side. And I'll sit in that bench, and it's chilly because it's fall. And I'll wear my flannel shirts, long sleeve shirts with plaid and my blue jeans. I usually have boots on. And Jesus will visit me at that place. He'll walk up behind me sometimes. Sometimes he'll come walking down the road. And we sit and we talk. We've skimmed stones together in a crystal clear lake. We walked against the current of a roaring mountain stream together. Let me stop right there because I want to, uh, in a lot of my visions, I encounter water. We walk along the, the, the shoreline of a, of, a, of a stream very often. And uh, water is significant to me because I have dreams, I have these recurring dreams about water. Uh, where I'm on a body of water, sometimes it's a lake or, or the ocean. One time it was a cranberry farm. That's weird. Uh, but you know, that, that's how they harvest cranberries. They fill them with water and the water comes yeah. up. And, um, but th that's what it was. But all of the time, when I'm on this water, I'm fearful because something is in the water that wants to harm me. I never knew what it was. I never knew it. But this is a recurring thing. And it's not always the same dream. But it's always the same thing. I'm on the water and I'm scared because I know something's in it. One time, I got to see what was in the water. One time, somehow, I wound up in the water. And I went down and I had my eyes open and there was a net, a fishing net, in front of me. What do they call them? A seine? It was a seine. And this thing came up to me and it was like a, uh, what was it, a sturgeon? A sturgeon is a big, massive fish. Uh, the Atlantic, Atlantic sturgeons have become, they can grow to be 900 pounds. They're massive. And they're not really, they're not man eaters, okay? They're really not. But this one wanted me. And, and so it came, but the only thing between us was the net. So I was not, I couldn't be harmed, but I could tell he wanted me. Okay, very, very fearful dream. <clears throat> Every time I encounter water, and I'm, when I'm in this safe place, it's not Jesus doesn't tell me this, but a voice tells me this. I hear this in my spirit. The voice says, nothing in this water can harm you. Nothing in this water can harm you. Jesus and I have been, we have walked upstream against the current of a, of a roaring uh, mountain stream. Like I said, we've skimmed stones across a crystal clear lake. And when we were doing that, Jesus looked at me and he said, why is it so important to you that you know nothing in this water can harm you? And I didn't know the answer. And, and that is kind of what, I think the reason he asked me the question was because he wanted me to find the answer. Here's what I found out. That my, my wife is an excellent dream interpreter. If you ever have a dream, it's like it bothers you. and She really is. She's got that spirit thing going on. But... Um, <laughs> I talked to her about these dreams. And uh, this is crazy, but this makes total sense. It was a sturgeon. Remember? The fish was a sturgeon. She said, wasn't there a, an old guy that used to preach? His name was Sturgeon? I said, no, no, that was Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon. So what about Charles Spurgeon, she said. So, well, he was a Calvinist. He believed in a very staunch, rigid God, a God that would be uh, 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 offensive to me. And then it hit me. Mm. It hit me. The water is my relationship with my God, with my Father. And as much as I've filled my intellect with God's goodness, as much as I've filled my head with his goodness and how good he is, there was still a fear inside of me in my heart, not in my head, in my heart, that he was that Charles Spurgeon God, that there was an ugly monster in God that was facing off with me. And the spirit, every time I get near a body of water, he says, nothing in this water will harm you. Guys, me and Jesus, we laid on the ground in the leaves, in the leaf litter, and we did snow angels in the leaves. We danced together before the Father. 
we've, we've gone on long walks down the road and many long talks where we talked about my loved ones and the people I'm concerned with and the, the things that I'm involved with. He told me things that I couldn't have made up in my head. He told me things that were like, I've shared some of it with Kathy. It's like, I couldn't have, I couldn't, I couldn't have made it up. He took me at one point to a childhood memory, similar to what happened with Roxy, and although this was not anywhere nearly as dramatic, and I couldn't take it. I had to get out of it. I had to tell him, I can't, I'm just, no, I can't do this right now. He said, that's fine. That's fine. Guys, I wish I had like a grand ending to that story, because, but I don't. It's, a, it's an ongoing story. I'm still in this relationship. I'm going to meet with him again soon. And I'll meet with him again after that. And I'll meet with him again after that. And after that. And after that. So there's no ending to that story. I want to read something. I got up this morning. And I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook. But there are, there's a couple of these guys who are really into God's goodness that I will, you know, I'll dig out their posts every day and see what they have to say. And one of my guys is this guy named Richard Murray. He put up a post this morning, and I thought, I just, I, I just have to say this. It said, when God becomes a philosophical concept rather than our closest friend, our hearts dry up and die. This was posted this morning. I've had long stretches in my life when I recognized and embraced him as my best friend, then at other times I have let him deteriorate into a mere concept, a philosophical outlook on life, a non-immediate reality a social science-ology of some kind. And though my intellect patted itself on the back, my heart soon got lonely. Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than any brother. This was Abraham's experience. God is our friend. God is not an abstract theory. He is a relational encounter. As Martin Huber said, life is meaty. Guys, I, I know that Jesus is near me. He is, he's in my mouth, and he's in my heart, or in my mind. I've learned how to remove the binoculars, get them out of my way, so I can see him very clearly. 